At Summer NAMM 2019, I wanted to make a different type of video that's typically done. I wanted to go in depth with philosophy and why certain pieces of gear were created. I wanted to go into the application and how this will change the way that we record or mix. Okay, we're here with Solomon Design with Henry, yeah. and he's got a really sweet product that I think you guys should know about. I'll let him take the mic. I am, I'm absolutely privileged. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I think people should know too. So what we do is, we currently are known for our uh, the Solomon Design Low Freak. Low Freak is our take on the sub mic, kind of a reengineering um, of the understood idea of it behind the sub mic stuff like. Uh, you generally had to use a pad with older versions. They were a little bit heavy, so our stuff was half the weight of other sub kick options, as some people will call it out there. Half the weight of that. The pad's already built in. It's kind of a plug and play version that's true to the source. A large cornerstone of what we do is whatever's happening in the room, that's what we're trying to translate to the recording or to front of house. Right. Um, a lot of people think of something like this and the, the, the kind of sub realm as a way to add to something. I'm gonna add lows to something. The question is, is it happening in the room? Because all we're gonna do is gather what's happening in the room. And a, a kick drum, like we have here, or say a bass amp, uh, even the, the bottom side of a Leslie, the second drive around a Leslie, are producing a lot of low end that you might have to fight with a standard instrument mic to get what it's doing. Mm. The idea is that let each mic do what it does best. In this case, it's producing that low end, low freak will pick it up. What makes this different from anybody that could just take an old speaker and yeah. wire it up? And That's the big question. A lot of people will come by and be like, why can't I just DIY one myself? Right. The short answer is you can. The question is, are you getting something that works? Have you done the work? We went through 27 different drivers wow. to find the one that was closest to what we wanted, went back to the manufacturer, had them re-engineered a little bit more to get to the focus that we wanted in the item itself, and that's what's in here. So it wasn't just grab something, make it look nice, and put it to market, right? right? Uh, like I said before, generally when you take uh, any kind of low-end driver and you basically just wire an XLR onto it, the gain you're getting off of it is pretty hot. You generally have to take your gain structure all the way down, maybe put a pad in line, that kind yeah. of thing. This has the pad already built in. Yeah. It's not switchable, it's hardwired into it. So what happens is the gain coming off of it is gonna match your standard Beta 52, D6, D112, the right. standard, it, it's all in that same kind of framework. So you set your main kick in mic, that Beta 52, D6, whatever, set that in, go to the next channel over, set your gain structure the same, not the EQ, but the, the gain structure, right. and you're gonna be five to 10% away from where you need to be depending on your instrument, depending on the room. The point is plug and play. Set it up where you need it to be, plug it in, and you're almost all the way there. Pricing was a big thing. Oh. For the manufactured versions of this, they were give or take 400, you know, $400 give or take. Yeah. We came to market with this now five years ago at $200. Wow. The perception of a kick drum implement is right around 200. Most of the other things in that realm are kind of in that range. So from the day, from day one in, in designing it, our thing was let's get it to that price point and get people not only what they need, but the price that they're expecting to pay so they can get the value they perceive out of it. Is there any circuitry other than the pad? No, everything is analog, it's all hand wired. But the pad itself combined with, and, and here's, here's another one of the things, people ask that thing and we have to EQ it to get to do certain things, so we're adding circuit boards, that kind of thing. No, the idea behind this to make it most robust was the design and the driver itself. The speaker, basically. Yeah, it's basically, yeah. it started out as a speaker and if you took right. it out and made it work as an output device, it'll right. still work but not as efficiently as it used to when it started. Yeah. The big thing about this was the design was in the driver itself. Finding the right thing, changing it, little things that people will ask us, hey, is it that magnet, that heavy magnet? That's what makes it sound that way. No. Is it the surround, the, the, the part around that lets it intrude and extrude? The answer is no. Is it the cone? No. Is it the coil? No. The thing is, it's all of those. All of those working in concert. Change one of those out and you won't get the same response. Yeah. So it's really a balance between all of that. At the end of the day, the sound is coming from that driver combined with the shell, which is not a resonant shell, it's not made of wood, it's actually made out of fiberboard to make it a non-resonant shell and bring the whole form factor down, small, a little easier to work with, and make it lighter as a result. Yeah. That kind of, I got a little sad, does that answer no, your question? That's, that's great. Yeah. So, so there's very few ingredients to what's it's, going on here. It's fairly simple, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. But the idea is that simplicity means there's not a lot of things that can break, not a lot of things that can go wrong. Yeah. We literally tested this thing once we were at that point where it's like, okay, we're bringing this to market. I threw it down a flight of stairs. 
<laughs> did we dent it? Absolutely. It looked a little ragged when it was done. Yeah. But you plugged it in and it worked. Right. If you can get through that, yeah. I'm a musician. I know I do dumb stuff. <laughs> I can drop this and let it roll across the floor. Yeah. Nine times out of ten, it's still going to work. Yeah. I just love this concept of taking the technology and flipping it. You know, a lot yeah. of people, they see a speaker, but a speaker is a mic and a dynamic mic is... A speaker, Cornerstone you know? of it is transducer, exactly. Yeah, One exactly. kind of energy into another kind of energy. Whereas yeah. a microphone generally is taking sound pressure and converting it to voltage. Right. A speaker is voltage converting it to sound pressure. Right. By flipping the application, you have to make some adjustments. And in this case, the fact that it's not working in the standard instrument range is the benefit. It's working in a lower range that yeah. allows it to do the same thing as a microphone, which it is a microphone. Yeah. It allows it to do that and stay out of the way of other microphones. So intended yeah. to work alongside another microphone and get a wider frequency response directly at your source. When people ask what's the one word for what we do, like what's the benefit of it? The word is control. You get more control over your source, whether it's a kick drum, bass amp, whatever it is, by getting those, those, uh, that information right at the source, then you can control it in post however you choose to. Yeah. A lot of times you have a speaker and a lot of thought goes into the size of the enclosure. Sure. And you have all these crazy designs about how to get the best yeah. out of the speaker. Is it not beneficial to use, uh, you know, the whole, like, NS10, for example? Sure. Like, with the cabinet and all? Well, or, let's talk about the NS10 because the yeah. NS10 was probably the, most people's point of reference as to where this started. Yeah. The reason the NS10 was started up, I pretty much was in the 70s, I think it's early 80s when the NS10 really came into prominence. Yeah. Everybody was using it. Good middle point reference, you know, it, it, it wasn't the perfect mix, but it worked on a lot of different uh, output sources really well. Yeah. So everybody had them and everybody blew them because they just cranked the hell out of them. They sound yeah. great when you crank them. You don't blow both, you blow one. So then you have this orphan NS10 sitting around, and that's kind of where this whole thing started. It, yeah. Let me take a good driver that's give or take six inches or so. Yeah. In this case, the NS10, I believe, was actually, um, yeah. I think I want to say it's a seven-inch driver. So the NS10, they would take that out and basically just hang it on a mic stand, wired reverse, yeah. and off they go. One of the issues with that is, and it's, it's kind of it's a, a simple physics issue, the NS10 is a closed-back cabinet. Yeah. So it had a controlled pressure that was working with the cone itself to return it to zero. Yeah. Intrude or extrude, it's fighting that to keep it having a certain kind of response. Yeah. When you put it in a bi-directional yeah. container, which this is, meaning that you have access air from both sides, yeah. you're just kind of suspending it in the middle, if you will. Yeah. When you do that and there's no pressure that's counteracting it, you end up with a signal that had a longer tail than the source did. So your kick was boom, but the signal you got was boom. So you're actually getting more than the source. Right. Which is why generally with that NS10 trick, you had to gate it, compress it, certainly EQ it to get it to sound like what was happening in the room. So it's kind of ringing out basically. Yeah, you're just getting a longer tail of what okay. that know what it was actuating. Yeah. Some people actually said it was a synthesizer. It's, it's kind of on the cusp right there. The idea being that the source does one thing, but you're getting more than the source. Right. It's synthesizing that sound or focusing on our frequency range, getting that to come out. From the very beginning, after trying out a sub kick, kind of mapping that out and seeing this is one of the issues that people have with it. Our intent was, again, true to the source. How do we curtail that tail to get it to do what is happening in, in, in the actual, right. in the room, on the, whatever the source is? Right. So again, with this, it was a matter of, it's not the magnet, it's not the surround, it's not the materials involved, it's a balance of all those things to get it to do yeah. what is happening in the room. So you mentioned the, the ringing out. Sure. Bit, and yeah. I mean, was there anybody that just took this, the NS10 without taking the speaker out and just set it down in front of I think of I've heard that from some people, yeah. I mean, was there a benefit to that? I mean, obviously you... you I've seen that and I've package. seen amps too, where some people yeah. just take an amp and just uh, just going directly into yeah. the thing and they're just putting the amp up against it. Yeah. The, the most benefit that I heard of taking an amp and doing that is you're actually doing the old cinder block with a kick drum trick again. Right. And you're basically adding weight so your kick drum isn't sliding. That was the yeah. big benefit of it. The issue is that what you're doing is you're not taking it the full yard as far as the design processes continue. Can you get a sound out of it? Absolutely. Yeah. Is it gonna be the right sound? That depends on two things. What does the right sound mean to you? Yeah. Number one. And number two, what are you trying to get out of your source? Yeah. It's not that it's wrong to do it that way. If that's your thing, do it, man. It's entirely yeah. up to you. We yeah. were trying to go with a different thing, which basically says, as opposed to a flat response over the entire frequency spectrum, let's focus on getting an honest response in yeah. the low end. 
and all day long I'll put up what we have against anybody on the market and certainly any kind of DIY thing. Yeah. But at the cornerstone, at the end of the day, every engineer knows their room, they know their equipment, they know their tools, their tools are their mics. If you know how to use your DIY thing, if that's your thing, amen. Keep yeah. doing it. Yeah. yeah. So the show yeah. probably doesn't resonate at all, yeah. or it doesn't... Well, certainly it, not as much as a solid is wood. Is it closed yeah. or open back in the... In it's the a back. bi-directional container, so it's actually open. Grills okay. on the front and back, allowing airflow through both sides. Okay, so the container is, the shell, I guess, sure. is uh, providing a sturdy surface so that the speaker... It's providing doesn't... structural support right. while not getting in the way of the response of the actual right. driver. Because it'd be like trying to put up a swing on a tree branch that sags, you know? Like, Absolutely. you lose all that momentum, you can never really get going. Absolutely, but if that if that branch is greener, right. if it's newer, it could flex a little bit without having an issue to a certain point. Right. And that's kind of what this does. It, it'll absorb a little bit. It'll flex a little bit, mm -hmm. which allows it to, again, not interfere with the frequency response happening directly at the driver itself. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is fascinating. I've always wondered about this stuff. I've played around with the guitar amp. Yeah. You know, trick and, and doing that. Actually, the first thing, what, what led to this was literally this kick drum was in, in my basement, and I was demoing some stuff out. I'm not the drummer, per se, but I was just yeah. demoing some stuff out. You know what? It sounded better in the room than it did on the recording. So it's like, oh, like everybody else, I'll just DIY some. Cool. Let me, I've got a driver right over there. And it was an 8-inch guitar amp driver. Hmm. So I put it in, and I tried it out. You know what? I got a signal. It wasn't a good signal. And I remember that one specifically, I think actually came out of a small fender amp. The surround on it was that little corrugated, looks like a chip, mm. little corrugated kind of paper around it, yeah. which sounded great in the amp, but for this specific purpose, it didn't work well. And ended up with a really focused kind of, uh, kind of a honky, a duck sound, kind of all yeah. kind of sounding thing. Interesting. That wasn't the right one. Yeah. So the guitar thing, absolutely, it might be the right one. What we found is that knowing a little bit about guitar amps, guitar drivers, um, uh, bass drivers, yeah. uh, even the kind of uh, the automotive like hi-fi kind of stuff. Yeah. All those little things, all those little disciplines all inform the final product, right. which is why this tends to work not just for, it's not just a hip hop thing. It's not just a, um, a math metal thing. Yeah. Um, there's jazz players that use only this as their kick drum thing. Uh, there's Daru is... is Daru loves it, yeah. absolutely. He's, 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 our, yeah. he's one of our signature artists. Yeah. Um, we player. have actually Roy Root and Future Man. He's actually oh, yeah. playing later tonight, and he uses two under his kit. Wow. The reason is he flips up his kick drum, and he actually plays the resonant head as well as the batter head. And he couldn't find anything to get that low end and still play dynamically. Think of this. With this, since you don't have to aggressively EQ, compress, or gate it like other versions, you can let it do more on its own and let it be a little more wide open. Yeah. If you have it heavily gated or compressed, you start playing lightly, and it's going to push that signal up or cut it off completely. Right. By leaving it more wide open, he can play what he calls these kind of thunder rolls, where he's yeah. playing on the edge and bringing it to the middle, and it's kind of like, you know, like, like, you're, uh, like you're actuating a gong, giving yeah. it that energy little by yeah. little, building that up. Uh -huh. He loved it because he was able to do that, and those low freaks are able to pick that up, even at quiet levels. Yeah. They're just doing it in a different frequency range than others do. Right. I got uh, sidetracked. Yeah, I love the whole concept of just a very minimal approach that is just very quality components that do their job. It's simple. Yeah. And we're trying to keep it simple. That's cool. At the end of the day, necessity is the mother of reinvention. We're not inventing the wheel. We're trying to reinvent it a little better based on what we're trying to accomplish with it. And going back research-wise, the most that I was able, or the, the earliest documented time I was able to find that somebody did this was recording a paperback writer with the Beatles. Sir Paul's playing that hollow body, the hollow body Hofner, and I think it was either a two by 12 or four by 12, but it was, it was 12 inch drivers. And it sounded big in the room and wasn't translating to the recording. Hmm. So engineers, back when engineers literally could open up the board, and just resolder everything, so yeah. they, they knew the huh? physics behind it. <laughs> they took another amp, pulled the output jack, went in, wired in reverse, and used that as a way to pick up the signal. So if it's coming out of one, let's use the same one to get that you signal. See, and I thought I was the one that came up with that. Did you? <laughs> you were on that session? No. I'm okay with that no, if you were. I was, in the, I was in the studio by myself, uh -huh. and I said, wait a second. What if? But at the cornerstone, like you said, the cornerstone of that is, it's, it's physics. It's right. a transducer. Yeah. So it may not be the perfect thing, your first try at it, which is why we went through a whole bunch of iterations to lead to that, and then 
the Mid Freak, which is what we premiered yesterday. Same concept, shifted up in the frequency range to work on different sources like floor time, like yeah. side of a snare, like guitar amp. Yeah. Same idea, yeah. shifted up in the frequency range. Well, thanks for telling me about this. Uh, I'm Absolutely. looking forward to hearing it. Brian, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks so much. So I basically want to talk about the model. It's called the Neo Black. Like I said, it was inspired off the Matrix. You know, everybody had those black suits that was fancy. And yeah, it's, it's like a like an alligator skin. I don't know if you want to zoom up, come closer. It's real cool. As you can see, your boy got a signature right there, Daru Jones. And then, you can't miss me. Nice face in the middle. <laughs> Get that soul hop, like the vinyl. But it's a real cool, you know, this color can match any drum kit. My name is Daru Jones. Shout to Ryan of Creative Sound Lab. Also shout to Solomon Mike's Designs. And we at SummerNam 2019, Nashville, Tennessee. Daru Jones, peace.